fine, but, but little smelly balls of sulfur. You ever smelled sulfur? It smells like rotten eggs. He finds little balls of sulfur. He sends them in for testing. It turns out they're the, the, the purest naturally occurring sulfur in the world. Which is pretty interesting. The only other naturally occurring sulfur that, that comes to the surface that could be similar is in a place called Hell, uh, Australia, where uh, you have this naturally occurring sulfur that comes to the surface, but it's all caked and yellow and nasty. And, and, and this stuff is like pure white little circular balls. He digs down further to see if there's like something sulfur underneath that's pushing the sulfur up, but there's no further sulfur under which then leads him to believe that the sulfur must have fallen from the, from the sky. Which is pretty amazing, right? Also, it's the only place in the world where, you know, if you, if you were to dig out here in the backyard, what would you find? There's like layers of earth, right? Okay. So, so how do you get those layers of earth? Well, modern atheistic, uh, uh, you know, geologists believe that there was a, a world, what they call a worldwide catastrophic water event. And basically, you know, if you were to take a, if you were to take a, um, a, uh, a cup of, and put different kinds of soil in there, like rocks, like maybe some little toy dinosaurs, and some different kinds of soil, heavier soil, lighter soil, sand, and you were to put some water in and stir it up, what would happen? Dinosaurs would settle at the bottom, the little toy dinosaurs, and then you'd have little rocks, and then you'd have heavier soil, and then lighter soil, and then like topsoil. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. So, so you stir it up. Now, now, they call that a catastrophic water event. What do we call it? <laughs> Noah's flood, right? So if you dig outside here, you will find that. You will see those layers. Right? Now, it's been said, like in the 50s, somebody had a theory that it takes 20,000 years for every layer, but I could show you that layers can form in 30 seconds with water. Right? <laughs> but... Um, but fascinatingly, um, this is the only place in the world where the lines do not go straight across. They wave up and down like this. Why? Because of the heat. So at some juncture, there was enough heat at these two spots to make them the only places in the world where the, where the, where the earth actually started to melt and actually started to wave up and down like water. Now, if this was proof that there was no God, every school kid would know about this. It would be on the cover of every major newspaper. But since it's like pretty lock and loaded evidence that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah really happened, like if ever there was evidence, right? People can go to jail for a lot less evidence than that. Right? Like if, if, they, if they show up at court with that kind of evidence, you're going to jail. And yet, many people still believe the story of Sodom and Gomorrah didn't happen. What a lot of people don't know about the text of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible is that it's a comparison and contrast story. So it's not, a lot of people just want to go straight to Genesis 19 and look at the story of, of the burning of Sodom and Gomorrah, not realizing that the story really starts back in Genesis 18. And it's a comparison of two men, of two fathers. Father Abraham, don't slam the fam. And Father Lot didn't do a lot. <laughs> And we're going to look at both stories and contrast them and see if we can come to some conclusions as Christians. Amen, guys? In Genesis 18, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. 
When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. Wow. Let's try to understand. This is a world, this is a time here in Genesis 18. There are no, there's no civilization in the sense that we think of it today with taxation and a country and you dial 911 and there's police. Abraham was totally on his own in the wilderness. Do you follow? So he would have been like his own country in a sense. Yes, the Samaritans had already come and gone, uh, uh, the uh, Sumerians, Sumerians. Yes, there had been some civilizations. But this was, has anyone seen the movie Mad Max? This is like Mad Max. And Abraham has his little fortress base, his little, his little nomadic camp. And he was a very wealthy guy. If you, le- if you read the scriptures leading up to this, he had tons of gold, silver, uh, uh, cattle, sheep, donkeys. I mean, this was a very wealthy man. He had 314 armed soldiers in his camp under his command. So he was a very wealthy guy, a very powerful guy. At a time when things were really out of control in the world... And there he is at the front of his camp, and he sees three guys walk by who he does not know. Let's be honest with ourselves. What would our response be? Very suspicious. Right? Most of us would be like, get the weapons. It's a scouting party. Right? But what's Abraham's response? He runs to them bows down to the ground in front of them. And as we're going to see, he invites them into his camp to eat and be refreshed. There's something different about Abraham. Verse 3, he said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under the tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. What incredible hospitality. What a father. What an example. He's such a powerful guy, and yet, even in the midst of having all this power, He's such a hospitable guy. You know, we live in a society today where where sadly a lot of men are not like Abraham. They, They lack the hospitality. They lack the service. They lack the love. You've seen them. They, they, they're, they're experts, and, and sadly, this can even creep, creep into the church. They become experts at having their like stone face. And, and what it is, is it's discord, right? Having, being, looking really mad or really sad gets you attention. And you can start to get addicted to that attention, right? And, and, and next thing you know, you're nothing like Abraham. I, I'm not saying that we should run to each other and, and bow down with our faces to the ground and say, my Lord, my, I'm your servant. But a, but a hug would be nice. Yeah. Think that's fair? Yeah. Like a hug, like a, hey, how are you? As, as fathers, we got choices to make. What kind of father we're going to be. But this isn't a lesson just to the guys. It's Father's Day, but my mission in life is not just to encourage people. It's also to teach and preach. So you have to expect that even though it's Father's Day, I'm going to go there a little bit. Are you with me? That's why, that's why you came to church, right? Yeah. Amen. Not only is this, is this a little hard on the heart of a father when they see the example, they go, whoa, I got to grow. But also I believe this is an incredible testimonial for the sisters. Yeah. This is the kind of guy you want to be interested in. Yes. This is the kind of guy you want to be interested in. Too many, too many young women these days, um, you know, they're interested in Ken and Barbie. They, they think that you can find yourself a Ken and dress them up and just, you'll, you'll, you'll make it, you'll make it right. 
you're, you're going to buy a fixer-upper. And, and things are going to work out. Let me just tell you something. Has that ever worked? Has it ever worked one time? Have you ever talked to another sister who did that, who's fired up? We, we have to have a little bit of a scientific approach here, right? You should look at the evidence. If you're, if you're really going to buy into an idea, you should check it out a little bit. See, see if it's the right idea. Guys have this thing called testosterone. They're not going to get changed by you. Newsflash. I'm saving your life right now, young sister. I'm saving your life right now. You will not change them. In fact... In fact, most guys, when you decide that you want to get married with them, think that you really admire them and look up to them. Right? They, they actually are under that impression. And when you get married to them, and then they discover that really you think of them as a fixer-upper, and that you want to change them, what do you think that... that all that testosterone and all those male traits are going to do. You're now, you're now going to deal with a guy who just realized that his bride does not look up to him, does not respect him, and thinks he needs to change, and thinks that she's the one who's going to do it. Suddenly you're dealing with a very unhappy, bitter, sad man. And that's never good for anybody. It's, it's better to be patient and wait and look at examples in the Bible like Father Abraham here. And when you see these examples of Father Abraham, right? Go, wait, that's the kind of guy I want to be with. A hospitable servant who gives. Not a fixer-upper. Amen, guys? Now, what Abraham didn't realize here is that his three visitors were none other than a pre-incarnate Jesus and two angels. So he's really hit the jackpot here. Are you with me? Like, in every way, he just hit the jackpot. He says to them, please come in to my house. After he bows down to them and says, my lords. I can imagine Jesus... Looking at the angels like, I told you Abraham's awesome. And the angels are like, you're right. You're always right, Jesus. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried to the tent of Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seas of fine flour and knead it and bake some bread. He, he doesn't just grab whatever he was cooking on the little fire there. He runs to his wife and gets her involved in being hospitable and serving. Then he ran to the herd. He doesn't walk. The Bible would have just said he went to the herd. It's trying to help us to understand the urgency level that he put. He ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf. And gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. Then he brought some curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared. And they set these before him while they ate. He stood near them under the tree. So he's standing under the tree. Probably with a, uh, I would imagine like a, uh, you know, a, a, a little waiter's napkin. <laughs> And he's got them. He doesn't join them in the meal. He stands and, and, and watches while they eat. I remember one of my uh, trips to Congo. The brothers, you know, said, bro, you got to take a break. Let's take a rest. We want to we wanna take you out to uh, a place we really like to go to. And uh, Congo was always fascinating because wherever I went, I was the first white guy to ever go there. <laughs> And uh, I remember one, one brother, police captain, he, uh, he you know, in, in, uh, in um, Central Africa, it's okay for men to hold hands, which is very uncomfortable for me as a Canadian. 
And, uh, and they don't just hold hands like this, they like actually interlock the fingers. So, so we're walking, you know, and I'm walking down the street and the captain like grabs my hands and like interlocks the fingers with me. And like, and they kind of massage your hand a little bit too, that I kind of, you see, encouraging little like friendship hand hugs. And I'm like, <laughs> walking down the street and, uh, and they take me to this, to this place, which to me looked like, uh, nothing. Like it, it, it was like, uh, just a scrap of land with some goats and, uh, some, some plastic tables and some chairs. And they go, we're here. I'm like, thank you. Good. What, what do you want me to do? Sit down. So I sit down and then they bring the goats. Like, what? Which one looks tasty? And I got these, and little goats are cute. Lord be with me. I'm like, you you guys choose. I I don't know, they all look so good. It's it's hard. It's, It's hard to choose. And so they go and they, they, they kill the goat, dress it, and then they have this like oil barrel with fire coming up and a grill. And they put the meat on top and they grill it. And then they, they set a very nice uh, newspaper in front of you and they put the meat on the newspaper with a little pile of salt. And it's very cool to like take a little piece of meat and dip it in the salt and eat it. And, and it's actually really tasty and awesome. And then there are these other people who bring you, like, they put vegetables in a, uh, in a leaf, and they wrap up the leaf, and then they grill the, 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 the whole thing. And they bring it to you. It's really nice steamed vegetables. So you got, you got your grilled goat, fresh. You just saw them two seconds ago. And, and your vegetables, you know what I mean? And... Um, And then for the sisters who sit at a separate table, it's not cool for brothers and sisters to be sitting at the same table because people get the wrong idea. So the sisters sit at a separate table and they eat the same thing, but it's very, it's considered very feminine and dainty and cool. You know, it's like, what's the term we would use? It's very delicate to eat um, uh, fried termites. So these guys come along and these little boys and they sell you like fried termites. And then the sisters like eat them like, like it's really cute like selfies, like a little bug in the teeth, and um, and that's and that's like a fun evening. And uh, and the drink that they drink is uh, it's like uh, you take wheat and carbs basically like you know grains and they boil it and then they run it off and it tastes like. Uh, it tastes like water that's been shaken up in um, in shredded wheat. What's it called? I can't remember. But, no, it's a, it's like a shredded wheat water, and uh, sometimes you can get it carbonated. And so, and you, and you drink that, and you have the meat, and you have the the termites, and you have the the vegetables, and it's actually really delicious if you could just get past, you know, your Western thinking. You know what I mean? And every so often, a brother like reaches his hand across the table and like squeezes your hand. You're like, <laughs> Abraham here is serving his guests in the same way as they still do in many parts of the world. Except he's so crazy hospitable that he doesn't even sit down with them. He stands to the side and serves them. This is someone with 314 armed guards at his immediate disposal. What's our standard as men, if I could talk to the men, of generosity and giving? What's our standard? As men who, who, who don't take, but who give. You know, you can impoverish your family by taking. You can impoverish your church by taking. 
As, as we stand right now, uh, this region, like a lot of other regions, 50% of what it costs to operate this region, so 50% of what it costs to operate your staff, your location, etc., comes from the rest of the movement. The, 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 the region here is not self-sufficient by about 50%. So either we got to double the size, which that sounds good to me, or double the giving, I don't know which one, and maybe a combination of them. But together as brothers and as men, we want this to be a region that doesn't take from the movement, but that gives to the movement. I believe that it's the brothers who are really going to lead the charge in this area. But one thing that's got to change is, is the heart to give. It's fair to say that you're going through a hard time and you don't have a lot to give. That's fair. But it's not fair to say that, that someone should give nothing. I come from an Irish Catholic background. And many of the, the greatest universities were started by the Irish Catholics because no one would let Irish Catholics into the Anglo-Saxon Protestant universities. So they had to start their own schools. When you don't give to your school, you impoverish yourself. Because they wanted their children educated, they gave to the school. They did not go to the school with a heart of taking. They went to the school with a heart of giving. The Anglo-Saxons, you know, the Brits and the rest of the guys, they would not let the Irish Catholics into their churches. So they built churches which to this day are some of the most beautiful churches in North America. Yeah. But they gave to those institutions and built those institutions. And within a generation or two, we actually had Irish presidents, Irish prime ministers, Irish Supreme Court justices, Irish engineers building the country. They gave to their institutions. They built up their communities. This is a conviction that comes straight from the Bible. God taught the people to give to the temple, give to the tabernacle. My salary actually has nothing to do with what you give or don't give. So I'm not talking to you about this based on anything that I'm going to get. I'm talking to you about, about this based on what we're going to build here. Yeah. It's not a if, it's a that. We will build here. We're going to build here because we believe in our children. I don't need to go any further than that. I got lots of other arguments, but that's, the, that's a good one. We're going to build something awesome because we want our children to be part of it. Sometimes people say, Tim, why, do you, why are you so crazy about making sure that the church is... You know, a great place for everybody. Why, why are you such a nutcase about that? Because my children are here. I'm a father. They have a righteous expectation of protection from me. If something goes bump in the night, I will be the first one at the door. And even if someone comes through that door who's way bigger than me, and even if I get knocked down, I will get back up. And since I have two and a half years of jujitsu and four years in the army, I think that he's in big trouble. But <laughs> let's let's say let's say that 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 I get knocked down, I will get back up, and then I'll call my brothers together, and 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 at some point we're gonna we're gonna make sure that the women and children are safe. Yeah. Christian women, Christian children have an expectation of this from the brothers. It's biblical, it's right, it's godly. God expects you to stand up and fight. Maybe God put the situation there just so you would stand up and fight. Sometimes you have an impoverished group, a group that that has not yet become self-sufficient. That's fair. The, The movement is very happy. No one's bitter. The movement is very happy. They go, no problem. We'll cover half the expenses in Southland. No problem. We'll cover half the location, half the staff, half everything. Giving them time and space to be able to build it. But if we don't even think that we should build it, what's going to happen? Here's a sad thing. 
half the people today, a good, a good third of you, at least a third will give nothing in contribution. How do I know that? Because that's what happened last week. That's what happened the week before. A third of you will give nothing. You have nothing in your pocket right now to give. Some of the people who give nothing showed up with a $12 Starbucks. Like a half-calf, chapalapa, half, half, half lat, strawberry, you know, cherry, like water of, water of life. And, and, and better shoes than I have. And they will not find it in their heart. And here's the factor. This is what it is. Now they go, well, I just, I just don't have a lot to give. No, you could not find it in your heart to give a penny. If someone puts a penny in an envelope and puts their name on it, their name does not come up on the did not give list. One penny. I, I will not receive any list with your name on it. I receive a list from every, every region in the entire church of those who missed contribution. Why? Because I, I want to follow up with them and I want to have a talk. I, I, I don't need your five cents. But you need to give five cents. You need to have a heart of not being a victim, but being someone who's going to help build this community for our children. When a brother comes into church and does not have, could not find it in his heart, I guarantee you if I look around that parking lot right now, I could find a penny. Could not find it in his heart to give a penny to build this church where I have my children. We are not friends. You and I are not friends and we have nothing in common. Don't call me bro. We're not bros. Find it in your heart. Let's say you don't have children. Give to my kids. Give to the other kids you saw here. They, they found it in their heart to give you a dad's, a dad's root beer today. Pay them back five cents. Sisters, when you see a guy, who see, when that envelope goes by, when that, when that thing goes by, and he doesn't put anything in, that is not a guy you go on a date with. He will impoverish you. You will be working at 50, 60 years old. You will be working and he will be on a couch. This is not Father Abraham. Some people go, well, I don't want a fam like that. Don't slam the fam. The fam is good. The family is good. In verse 16, Abraham is walking his, his visitors out. And God says something very special. Verse 17. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Wow. Here's, here's God, right? He didn't know that he was serving Jesus. Here's God. And God goes, man, you know what? I just love Abraham so much. He will become a great and powerful nation. And the whole world is going to get blessed through him. I've chosen him. Why? Because he directs his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right. So the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he promised. What, what do we see here? Abraham ran a tight camp. It was a highly organized tight camp. It was a place of generosity. It was a place of giving. Nobody was starving. Everybody was working hard. But he directed his family. Now, now Lot, he didn't do a lot. 
But, but Abraham knew how to run a family. And God says, I love this guy so much because he keeps an orderly family. A lot of us grew up in families where our dads were not present. I was raised by a single mom. And while my dad was there for the first 13 years, he was very rough with us. He, he, was, he was constantly pouring out discouragement. Uh, every, every couple days he would tell me, Tim, the best job you're ever going to get is working at a gas station. There's nothing wrong with working at a gas station, but that's not a very encouraging thing to say to a 10-year-old kid. Yeah. Every, every day there was some kind of little, little hit, little discouragement. But I always told myself, you know, Dad loves us and he's tough on us because he loves us. But then at 13, I found out that he was molesting my sister. And it suddenly clued in. This guy hates us. He was, he was abusive, verbally abusive. And meanwhile, he was abusing my sister. The, the level of pain and hurt and discouragement and anger that comes into you when you find out something like that happened is very hard to describe. Yeah. I, I had so much hate for my father. I joined the army, 17 years old, and I powered myself through the army, my whole days in the army, four years, by, by thoughts of killing my dad. Never talked to him. Very hostile towards him. And then I became a disciple. And while I was studying the Bible, I shared this with somebody and they said, if you're going to become a disciple, you have to forgive your dad. He's a messed up guy, but you've got to forgive him. I said, I don't know if I could do it. I don't know if I could do that. But I prayed about it and I made a decision to forgive my dad. Forgiveness isn't just saying, like, I forgive you, but I'm never going to talk to you. No, forgiveness means that you're now going to be the adult in the situation. And even though I deserved as a boy to be loved and I didn't get it, I made a decision to love my dad the way that I wish he would have loved me. Christmas, we send cards. Every couple months I call. A couple times a year we get find a way to be with him and encourage him. My kids don't know a, a single thing, but they know that I love and respect my dad. And, and my dad last year, let me know that, uh, he's dying of cancer and, um, he has Parkinson's disease. And, um, he looked at me and he said, uh, He said, you're my best friend. God, God has worked through the cancer and the Parkinson's disease to really humble this man. And <laughs> I mean, he's, he, and, and I think through, through God working through my desire to be a friend to him and love him, I think that he's really, really changed. Uh, I would not be surprised if my father becomes a, a disciple before he dies. I sent him a uh, MP3 player for Christmas last year, uh, an MP3 player with uh, our brother Kip teaching the first principles. And he listened to the whole thing. And he said there was nothing there he disagrees with. It's not going to take much. Something, something more just needs to happen. I don't know what it is, but I, I believe my dad, I could, I could have the joy of baptizing my father before he dies. Yeah. My dad did not run a camp like Abraham. But I have a chance to. So I'm, so I'm there for my kids. I'm there for my church. I'm, I'm there for my community. 
I grew up in, in poverty, raised by a single mom. I had holes in my pants, holes in my shoes. We lived in the worst part of town. Went to a very tough high school, came home, beat up all the time. No dad there to encourage us. And I could very easily make excuses and say, well, because of my upbringing, this is the way I'm going to be. Absolutely. Do not think that it doesn't cross my head. But I made a decision to be different. I failed grade five. I failed grade seven. But then I decided to go back to university as an adult at 21 years old after getting out of the army. Today I stand before you with a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a doctorate. What's, what's, if I can do it, I'm a, I'm a chubby, bald Canadian guy. If I can do it, why can't you do it? What's the difference? What's the difference? It's a choice. I realized how bad the situation was, and I decided deep in my heart that this was going to stop, and my children were not going to have to go through this. This was going to stop. You can make the same choice. Brothers, make that choice. Today, I don't want to see a single brother on that, that ridiculous, embarrassing list of humiliation. Sisters, you can make a choice. Do not feel sad or sorry for a brother who's a wuss. Love him. Yeah, love him. Encouraging. He's your brother. High five. That, that, gets, him, that gets him a hug in the fellowship. It doesn't get him a ring on his finger. You know, I love this, this scripture because to me, it's the first time that we see Matthew 28 in the Bible. We all, we all know and love Matthew 28, right? Who, who can recite it for me? Who? Right? Go make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. Surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. Well, check this out. He goes, surely I've chosen him so he will direct his children and his household after him. Go make disciples and baptize, uh, go make disciples, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you by doing what is right and just. And the Lord will bring about for Abraham, just as we promised, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. I believe Matthew 28 is a quote of this. Jesus was paraphrasing this. And because of that, God goes, you know what? I love this Abraham guy so much. I'm going to tell him what I'm, what I'm about to do. In verse 20. Then the Lord said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see what has been done. And if it's as bad as the outcry that has reached me, if not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. So, so God tells Abraham what he's about to do. You follow? He's like, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to find out what's going on. And if it's as bad as I find out, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, let me be very transparent with you. If God came to me in the middle of the night and said, Tim, I love the way you do things. You're, you, you like, I mean, you disciple your guys, you make leaders, blah, blah, blah. Talk to me. Talk, if God talked about me the way he talked about Abraham here, I would be so happy. I would not be able to see straight. Right? And then he goes, by the way, you know, I just want to let you know, I'm going to destroy Los Angeles. I'll be like, God, what, what an honor. Thank you for telling me. Uh, wow, you, you love me and you're letting me know that you're going to destroy us. I'm going to send out a quick mass text to all my friends, all the disciples. Hey guys, God's about to destroy Los Angeles. Let's get out of here. Right? I don't, I don't think I'm alone. I think most people would be like, yeah, th- thank you. Right. You know? And, and you tell the story for the rest of your life. Like, God visited me and told me he was going to destroy Los Angeles. I got my friends out. Right? 
But check out Abraham here. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Oh my gosh. Let's be honest, because most people go, yeah, that, that, I would do that. Right. Most people would not do that. Right. You're talking to a God who's about to nuke a city. Right. You have to be very careful how you talk to someone like that. Right? right? Yeah. Like God's like, hey, I'm about to nuke this city because of sin. You got anything to say about it? No. <laughs> Sounds good. Praise God. But, but Abraham, here's, here's something pretty, pretty amazing a lot of people don't understand. Did not want Sodom and Gomorrah to be nuked. That, that's different than a lot of Christians thinking. Because they're thinking, yeah, there's sin. Nuke it. Yeah. Abraham's like, no. There's righteous people mixed in there who could change. This week we saw a ter- terrible tragedy happen. Someone walked into a nightclub with an AR-15 and killed 50 gay people. We don't agree with homosexuality. But we certainly do not agree with mowing people down because you think you're better. Abraham doesn't agree with that action. I don't need to say, who cares what I think? Abraham doesn't agree. Abraham... If God were going to go into the nightclub, Abraham would have said, God, will you sin like this? Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? What if there are people in there who could change? Abraham talked to God. I'm not twisting the scripture, am I? When God said, I'm going to go wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham pleaded for Sodom and Gomorrah. The guy who walked into that shooting thing would have been, Amen, God, let me join you. God was testing Abraham. Abraham understood God better than a lot of us understand God. Abraham understood compassion. Yeah. But you know what else? Probably about a third of you, I'm not going to embarrass anybody by putting hands or showing hands or anything, but a third of you didn't have a quiet time this morning. I know that. I've been in the ministry 15 years. You know why you didn't have a quiet time this morning? Because unlike Abraham, you don't believe that God will change his plan for you. Abraham believed that God would change his plan for him. Is that incredible? So he he goes, God, what if there's 50 people who could change? God goes, okay, if there's 50, I won't destroy it. That That needs to make us understand something. And I believe that every person who understands this will have an incredible quiet time tomorrow morning. Because you're, you're going to go, this is not a waste of time. You don't worship God because you're awesome. You worship God because He's awesome. You worship God because you have no choice. Because He's that awesome. You just have to. If, if, if I can tell you that you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and there's going to be a million dollars in your bank account, what time are you going to sleep until? You won't sleep. Right? Like 12.01? Like get a nice little one minute night sleep? And then you're going to be straight on Amazon buying cool stuff. Right? Amazon Prime. You get it delivered for free the next day. But because... 
Many people do not believe God will change His plan and that He has a plan that's unchangeable. They sleep in rather than having their quiet time. Is that not true? Yeah, I'm not asking for a show of hands or anything, but I, I think that I could get like a little amen. amen. This, is, this is what's going to make the difference. Conviction. Amen. Knowledge of the examples that we have in the Bible and the truth. God will change His plan for you. Amen, guys? Verse 26. The Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole city for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five people? Remember, he's talking to a God that nukes cities. If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 could be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak one more time. What if only 10 could be found there? He said, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking to Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. God didn't change his plan for him one time. He changed his plan for him eight times in one prayer. Do you have the compassion of Abraham for those who are in sin? But who could change? And do you have the faith in God that believes that God will change his plan for you? That he loves you? And that, in fact, that's, that's part of why he wants you to pray to him. He wants, he wants to work with you in a partnership. That's, that's, that's what fathers do when they love. We want to do stuff with our kids in a partnership. We, we want to bring them into the family business. God's family business is saving souls. And now he's brought Abraham into the family business, which is also saving souls. This is the camp of Abraham. It's strict. Fathers can be strict. Can't we? we? We can be strict, but it's out of love. A good father is strict, but loving. A good father is generous and giving. A good father has a great relationship with God. A good father understands that he has a father. And that just as he will change his plans for his children, his father will change his plans for him. We need prayers right now, guys, as a church. We've got 900 disciples here in Los Angeles. But we don't want to sit at 900. We want to raise up leaders who can go evangelize the world. How many cities are there in the world? Thousands. Thousands. And the evangelists and women's ministry leaders who are going to lead the churches in those cities, churches that are bigger than everybody we have here, churches that are bigger than everyone in Los Angeles, are here in this room right now. But we need prayers for them. We need prayers for them. I, I, I'm begging you to wake up tomorrow early and pray that God blesses us with abundant leaders. Pray, pray by name for the brothers in here. God, I, I pray that this brother can raise up and become a powerful evangelist, a powerful shepherd, a powerful deacon. I, I, I pray that 
this brother will dramatically change his derelict of ways and, and that, a, that an awesome sister will just, just change his life and encourage him. Th- these are the prayers that we desperately need prayed right now. Starting, starting today, but, but starting tomorrow morning, if absolutely necessary. And then, and then to pray like that every day. And God will answer our prayers. So this, this gives us a good idea of what's going on in the camp of Abraham. But now let's contrast it with the camp of Lot. Are you with me? So we have an image in our head and God has a credit. He says, I love this guy. I can't even keep my secrets from this guy because I love him so much. But now we're going to contrast. We're going to see the, the sort of like the other side. And it's going to help us to understand. Because sometimes a negative message can actually help you to understand something. Yeah. Yeah. Positive messages are great. But sometimes a negative example. You can learn a lot from a negative example. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. In Genesis 19. Starting in verse 1. The Bible says the two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting at the gateway of the city. Wow, so he still remembers some stuff from Abraham. That's cool. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed with his face to the ground. My lords, he says, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. Wow. So to so this guy's, he remembers some stuff. There's a lot of Abraham still left in him. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. These guys had come to pick a fight. But we'll just stay in the square. We're looking forward to someone trying to mess with us. And then we're going to sort out business. This whole place is going down. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. Wow. That's, there's some righteousness in here. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. So so who? Everybody. Every man, young and old. Who has Lot impacted? Nobody. He's a nice guy. He likes to be friendly with everyone. He doesn't want to challenge anyone. He doesn't preach God's word. Why? Probably because people will think he's being a judge. But I think as we're going to see, that kind of happens anyways. Surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. So all the men of the city come out and they want to abuse his two visitors, not knowing that they're angels of the Lord Almighty. That's a big mistake. Now, Lot had some righteousness in him, but what you're about to read is what I believe is the most twisted piece of scripture. It's the most twisted thing described in all scripture. So he was righteous, but, but he had become twisted. He'd become, he'd become gnarly because he, he had not converted anyone in the city, but they had started to convert him. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him. He said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do to them whatever you like. But don't do anything to these men who have come into the protection of my roof. Every daughter has an expectation of protection from her father. And he violated that protection. He offered his own daughters. What's the difference between Abraham's camp and Lot's camp? Pretty dramatic difference. He, He tried to do right, but he did right in such a nasty way. So he's still trying to protect his visitors, but he offered his daughters. Get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge. You see, at the end of the day, 
When you share your faith with people, they're going to think you're judging them. So here he's worked his face off not to anger anybody. But yet at the end of the day, they all are accusing him of exactly what they would have accused him with anyways in the beginning. Yeah. Oh, look, this guy's a judge. It would have been better just to get it out of the way at the beginning and at least make a few disciples. Yeah. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Could you imagine the angels? They, they see Lot go out. And he's like, hey guys, don't, don't hurt these, these, these visitors, but, but take my daughters. The angels are like, what the heck is this guy talking about? They open the door, they pull Lot in, they're like, Lot, stop talking. Like, just don't say anything more. You, you, everything that comes out of your mouth is crazy. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, daughters-in-law, any, anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here, because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out to speak to his sons-in-law. Now, who were his sons-in-law? The Bible says that every man, young and old, had come to the door. So all he had to do was just go out. His sons-in-law were struck blind at the front of his house. And these were guys that he was going to marry his daughters to. He said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. Why? Because probably he was a joker. You know those guys you can't tell if they're joking or not? That's not right. As a father, when I talk to my kids, I want them to know that I'm always serious. I, I might be, I, I try to be a funny dad. I try to be encouraging, but they should not have to go, is dad being serious right now? They should know dad's pretty much always serious. He can be seriously encouraging, seriously funny, or seriously serious. But one way or another, when I tell them something, my expectation is that it's going to get done. Here, Lot could not be taken seriously by his own sons-in-law. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, hurry. Could you imagine? You just got told that the whole city is going to burn. And you're hesitating. But that's the kind of guy Lot was. He was a guy who hesitates. Hurry! Take your wife and your daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hands and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. Sometimes things happen in life where you feel like you've been forced. Like, like an angel just grabbed the situation and you just had no choice in the matter. And sometimes we can think that that's God working against us. But in fact, oftentimes it's God's mercy. Yeah. Sometimes those things that happen that you had no choice in the matter are actually God's mercy. As soon as they brought them out of the place, verse 17, they said, flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere on the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, no, my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes and you have shown great kindness to me by sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me and I'll die. Look, here is a town near enough to run to, and it's small. Let me flee to it. It's very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. What are the, what are the angels saying? They're saying, dude, go to the mountains. And he goes, no, 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 I don't want to go to the mountains. Let me just go to this little town over here. God is always calling us to have great ambitions. God wants you to go to the mountains. But so many people insist, even to angels. No, I only want to do small things in my life. I will not accept any great challenges because I could fail and that would hurt. I will not go to the mountains. I will only go to this tiny little place, Zohar. 
And Zohar in Hebrew means small. What about us, brothers? It's Father's Day. It's not just a day to be encouraged. It's a day to really think about being a father. And be encouraged. But also think about what we can improve. Are you, are you going to the mountains with your family? Or are you happy with Zohar? As, as brothers, we, we're the ones who are going to lead the charge to go to Zohar. Finally, the angels are literally cracked by this guy. His, his hesitation and mediocrity is so great that even angels break. Is that incredible? The angel says to him, very well, I grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town is called Zohar. Could you imagine being so mediocre, so hesitant, that even angels just give in to you? The angels are like, dude, what are you talking about? Go up to the mountains. Who was at the top of the mountain? Abraham. What, what would have changed if Lot had showed up to Abraham's camp? How would the whole history of the Bible have been changed? But he insists on going to Zohar so strongly that the angels crack. How many angels have you cracked? When the angels called you to go after education, or the angels called you to go after a better job. Have you cracked any angels, brothers? It's time to listen to the angels who are speaking God's word. It's time to listen to those folks in our life. And yes, it's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard, and you're going to fail. You know one of the most important things that someone ever told me about being an evangelist? He said one of the most important things you need, one of the most important things, not the most important thing, but one of the most important things you need as an evangelist is a really bad memory. You gotta, you gotta just forget your mistakes, repent, forget, and move forward. And be just as encouraged tomorrow as you are today. By the time Lot reached Sohar, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur from Sodom and Gomorrah, from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. Now God had told Lot's wife and everybody, do not look back. But Lot's wife was led by a guy who never kept his word, who was always joking around, who did not really expect the family to be totally unified. And so she was used to just kind of doing her own thing because she kind of had to. She was independent. But what she, she failed to understand is that even though she had a milk toast husband, the angel of the Lord is not milk toast. Do not disobey the angel of the Lord. Your husband might let you get away with that, but God will not. Verse 26, but Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. She thought, man, I, I, I never really listened to Lot anyway. I mean, the guy just doesn't even know what he's talking about. I, I kind of always disobey, so let, let me just see how this works out. One time, dead. She became a pillar of salt. Who do I blame here? Lot. This is not really about this poor woman. This is about Lot. This is about Lot having a relationship with his wife where he's her bodyguard. He's her protector. He's her provider. He's someone that she can trust. Someone that she's going to listen to and follow. Oftentimes, guys want to say, oh, my wife never follows me. Sometimes the person you need to start with is the guy in the mirror. I have the incredible privilege to have a beautiful, awesome, incredible Christian wife, Leanne. And there were times in our marriage where I didn't feel like she was following me. 
And I came to the realization that really the problem was not her, the problem was me. Become the type of leader that people want to follow. And when you turn around, you'll find that they are. Lot goes on here, and his daughters, realizing that there was no husband there for them, they followed the practice of the Canaanites, which was that, in a very sick way, they would would have children from their father. So at least the property could stay in the family. They got Lot drunk, and this is what happened. These children became two of the most dangerous tribes in the history of Israel. Verse 36, Lot and his two daughters left Zohar and settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zohar. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. One day, the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man around here to give us children. As is the custom all over the earth, with the Canaanites anyway, let's get our father to drink wine, and when he's asleep, we will preserve our family line through our father. The result is the Moabites and the Ammonites. Two tribes that if you read the Old Testament, constant trouble to Israel. You know what's encouraging? Is that in Hebrews 10, Lot is mentioned as someone who actually makes it to heaven. So somewhere on the line, this guy repented. And there was enough righteousness in him that somehow, even though he fathered the two worst possible case scenario tribes. Like that's, that's not something to be proud of on Father's Day. You know what I mean? Like, hey, happy Father's Day. Mm. My kids are the two worst terrors of all of Israel. And yet, somehow, some way, God found a way to get him to heaven. Why, why did God put this story in the Bible? Why did, why did God create this story of Lot and Abraham? I believe it's there so that we can make a decision. God wanted us to know the options. I believe that in every single one of us, there's a lot of Abraham. You can go, wow, I'm a little bit like Abraham. But in every single one of us, including myself, there's a lot of lot. Hesitation, mediocrity, warpness that can come in when you're not close to God. And for every single one of us, this is a warning. Myself included. It's a choice. To be like Abraham or to be like Lot. We know that this is a true story from the modern archaeology. We can tell that this really happened. It was a catastrophe that happened in our family in the past. As many of us have had catastrophes in our families in the past. But it doesn't mean we have to have a catastrophe in the future. Today's Father's Day. It's a day to decide what kind of father you're going to be this year. A father like Abraham or a father like Lot. A father who knew how to lead a family and a father who had no idea. A father who knew how to be generous as we're going to have an opportunity to today in the contribution. Or a father who was a taker. I put before you, brothers, that today is the day, no matter what Satan says to you, is a day that you can decide and God will support you in your decision. And that whatever you pray for tomorrow morning in your quiet time, God can make it happen. Today's the day to choose the type of fathers we're going to be in the coming year. I love you guys very much. Thank you.